Hi, and welcome to School of Hustle. I'm your host, Sarah, and this is the show where we chat with everyday entrepreneurs about everything that goes into starting a new venture. New York City is one of the most iconic and expensive real estate markets in the world. Eric Benheim, the CEO, president, and founder of Modern Spaces, has completed over seven billion in sales and has overseen more than four billion worth of real estate at any given time, which equals about 8,000 units. Modern Spaces swept the Long Island City market by storm and completely changed the perception and value of real estate in the area. Eric, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Sarah. I am a resident of one of your apartment buildings. Yes, you are. And it is literally the nicest place I've ever lived in. Thank you. So your interior design skills have really impressed me. I'm I mean, glad every to hear. <laughs> every person that walks in my apartment is like, wow, this is so nice. Yeah, it's nice, good. Thanks, I'm happy. <laughs> of course, of course. So tell me a little bit about Modern Spaces. Uh, so we're a real estate brokerage and marketing firm mm -hmm. and so aside from being like a traditional brokerage where we help somebody find a home, sell a home or either buy or rent, we also work with developers on mm -hmm. consulting them on the project from the inception all the way to completion. Um, so like this building right here that we're sitting in, uh, this is a project that we had worked on probably for two or three years uh, mm -hmm. prior to you actually moving into the building. Uh, and so the developer would give us a call, hey Eric, I'm buying a piece of land, I could do this, what do I, I have this many square feet, what do I do here? Mm -hmm. And then we kind of like help him assemble, the in, him or her assemble the entire team. Wow, so it's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it's we do a, a lot. You do a lot of yeah, different things. We're like full service. For sure. Yeah. And it's interesting because you didn't originally start in the real estate industry. You were in live event production. Yeah. So tell me about that process. Like you were doing something else. You had a different job completely and you decided to shift into real estate. Why make that change? So I was actually, I used to throw rave parties. Uh, oh, fun, yeah. We should the, have a rave in these <laughs> apartments. <laughs> so in the 90s and back then, it's actually very similar because I'd had to find a location uh -huh. and you'd book DJs, right? And that's kind of like the team that you're putting together, right. right? And then you're marketing the party or an event or whatever the case. And so I kind of always had that kind of like skill, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, and then after 9-11, nobody wanted to party anymore. I decided mm. to do a little bit of a career change because it was just a little bit of a hard time here, especially here in New York. Yeah. I got into real estate. I thought it was be, thought it was going to be something uh, temporary. Uh, I thought I just wanted to go back to doing partying again. <laughs> uh, and then probably I, when I first started, I hated it actually. Really? Yeah, I didn't like it at all. Uh, and then after maybe like two or three years, I, I just started getting really into it. And then uh, I was a Manhattan agent. Okay. And then in 2005, I was at a party in Long Island City. All right. uh, there was nothing going on over here. And I saw a sign for a new building that was being constructed. And I was like, you know what? I, I kind of like it over here. I think I can sell this area. Yeah. And there was n literally nothing over here. Yeah, uh, it was, was like literally not developed really at <coughs> no, all. No, there was really older like walk up t type of railroad mm -hmm. buildings or like single family houses, some of those, mostly industrial. And then it was just one tower, which was uh, the Citibank Tower, which wow. has been here since 1988. So uh, from 2005 to today, we've seen a huge shift in the development of Long Island City. Correct. Um, now this is very much like, I would say, a more luxurious area to live. Uh, it's more high-end buildings. Um, back in 2005, you didn't really have that at all. No. Uh, so I know that your uh, company actually helped create many of the buildings here. Correct. So we have like a 70% uh, market share over here. Yeah. So if you know somebody who lives here, there's a seven and ten percent chance wow. that they came through us. Uh, in 2018, Long Island City was named um, the fastest growing neighborhood in America. Whoa. Um, which basically was huge because all based on all the construction and not just residential. There's mm -hmm. obviously is a huge residential development going on over here. But there's also a lot of commercial yeah, uh, going on this. over here. So just like down the block from here is the headquarters of Bloomingdale's. Uh, oh. Across the street is uh, the JetBlue headquarters. Yes, so I see that giant sign. Yeah, so there's just a lot. Of, it's really like a live work kind of a community over here. And then we became kind of like on the world map mm -hmm. uh, during the 2019 announcement 
of Amazon. Right. <laughs> so when, when the whole wah, wah, when I the know. whole Amazon uh, was announced that it was going to come here, uh, we were really kind of like in the center of it all. Mm -hmm. um, everybody here kind of felt like, oh my God, this is like the lotto, right? Yeah. It was supposed to create like twenty-five to 40,000 jobs and it was really like exciting and it, it created a lot more interest. I was getting calls from people in like Paris, I want to buy an apartment over here. Wow. Right, so it, was, it definitely put uh, Long Island City on the global map. So how did you know that this area was going to be successful back when you were at that <coughs> party in Long Island City, middle of nowhere, you see a building for sale. Why did you decide, you know what, I'm going to invest in this area even though there's nothing here? I, A, we're five minutes from Midtown Manhattan. Okay. Um, there, where Midtown, like in 10 minutes you could be in Bloomingdale's. It's uh, amazing. I it's know, that's really, why I love it here. Correct. Like, so if you're living, like, it's a $7 taxi ride. Yeah. If you're living uptown or even downtown, right, it's cheaper to go to Midtown from here than it, than it is from any of those areas. Mm -hmm. Even if you're on the, west, on the west side of Manhattan, it's still quicker to get to Midtown, at least Midtown East, where everything is happening from Long Island City than anywhere else. We also have, in my opinion, uh, the nicest waterfront in the entire city. Yeah. If you haven't been to the waterfront here, it's iconic with the gantries, gantries and with the State Pepsi Park. Cola and the Pepsi Cola Beautiful. sign. Very iconic uh, waterfront. It's probably been uh, Instagram like 10 million times or yeah, something. Yeah, at least 5 million by <coughs> me. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's just, I just, at the time, I just kind of like saw it. Uh -huh. uh, and this one building that opened up, I was just like, you know what, let me put, I took the information and I put up an ad on Craigslist. Mm -hmm. And back then, Craigslist was like the place to put up yeah. real estate ads. Yeah, it wasn't creepy. It was, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have to put maybe like 10 or 20 ads to get maybe one client. Wow. When I put up this one ad, it was just one ad, I got like 40, 50 clients. And why do you think that was? I think... It, people would, I, I, my ad was the next hot neighborhood in Long Island City mm. was my ad, it was like the subject of it. And I think just people kind of always have heard of Long Island City. Yeah. And then from that, I built like a newsletter back then and just like hustling, like, right. like I had to. And I built a client base. And when that building opened up, I was, remember, I, I wasn't like, a, I was just a regular agent, yeah. right? So I built a client base, and when the building opened up, the building opened up on April 1st, 2006. So April 1st, April 2nd, 2006, I sold 18 apartments. You sold a lot of units in a small amount of time, which isn't common for a real estate agent. Clearly, you had sold people on the vision of Long Island City, because in 2006, there really wasn't much here. How did you do that? So I started getting really obsessed with the neighborhood. Uh -huh. And being a Manhattan agent, you're really competing. In Manhattan, there's about 22,000 agents, right? So you really have a lot of com competition. Mm -hmm. I knew that over here, there was really nobody focusing in this area. Mm. So I decided to, to really like learn about the history, learn about what's coming. And I would do these like walking tours. Oh, really? Yeah, so I started doing like walking tours to start, hey, well, this was built in whatever, and this is built <laughs> over here, and, and just like I became like a tour guide almost, wow. right? Because I had so many people interested. Uh, and doing these walking tours, I would sell them, on the, sell them first on the neighborhood. Okay. And then once I sell them on the neighborhood, I sold them on the building. What was the first step that you did to make Modern Spaces NYC a reality and get more people into Long Island City? So when I started the company, I was at another company uh, and another agent uh, at the we were at a, I was at a party at another agent. Another party, man. Another party. You're a party animal. <laughs> <laughs> and I was at a real estate party uh, and another agent, a colleague of mine, uh -huh. goes to me. We were in Long Island City. He's like, "What are we doing? We should start our own company." And you were like, light bulb. Exactly. And the next day we met at a bar and we're like, yeah, let's make it like a Long Island City focused uh, mm -hmm. company. And we found a, a space like within a month. It was a ground floor apartment because there, was there wasn't that much retail at, this, at the right. time. So it was a ground floor. It's very industrial here. It was very industrial. And so it was a ground floor apartment and we made a deal with the landlord where we're going to convert the ground floor into a retail space. Uh -huh. Uh, and so we went into construction, signed a lease, went into construction, and then around July of that year, this is 2008, in July of that year, uh, we opened up shop. So it just kind of added on, it seemed like. It seemed like you got one building and then it was a referral type thing where every time you worked really well with someone, 
they thought they said, hey, I have another building, or I know someone else that's looking for this. Correct. And that's kind of how your business expanded. Correct. And in that year, so there was about four other buildings on that year. Mm -hmm. So that year, we took over every building from uh, all, all the competitors, mm -hmm. and then we ended up building ourselves in the market. And then from that, then developers started going to us, and then we started planning out, you know, to this day, we've planned um, thousands and thousands and thousands of units, over 12 million square feet uh, of residential space we planned uh, to date, and we, it's really exciting. And we're in other markets now, too. We're not just... Uh, yeah, you're, in, we're in, you're Astoria, in Astoria, and you're in Jersey City. And we just opened up in Jersey City. So how is that going? So we just, we opened up during the pandemic. Great. Yeah. <laughs> so one thing about, one thing about... Uh, but you have uh, experience with that. That's yeah. like how you're used to starting businesses. Almost. So I, th I think the thing with the, the way I work, where I've never had a business plan, uh, I've had several offices, and if my office, is, uh, if I go and I, somebody tells me, hey, if an agent, we should open up an office over here, I'm like, all right, let me go see it. I'll go see it. I like it. I'll meet the landlord and make a couple of jokes to the landlord, get friendly with the landlord, and I'm, I'll probably make a deal right there mm -hmm. without even thinking of, hey, I want to have an office in this location. So what about when you work with big buildings, right? How do you decide if you're going to end up working with them based on how much potential you think that building has? So uh, when we're working with a developer, yeah. depending on where the location is, yeah. sometimes, so, I mean, we've worked on, uh, like small, I'll give you a good example. Uh, the developers of this building, for example. Mm -hmm. So they were developing two buildings at the same exact time, uh, condo buildings, a few years ago. And they were probably like eight or nine blocks away from each other. Okay. And we were like, okay, we're gonna be launching two, exact, two buildings around the same time, around the same size. One was like 50, one was like 20 something units. How do we not compete with each other? Right. Right. Yeah. So then we took information. A lot of a lot of my agents were for that year were telling me, Eric, you know, we we get a lot of people who are looking for like pre-war hmm. uh, co-op, and there's no that it's a new neighborhood. Okay. So you don't really have pre-war no. over here. You have industrial factories. You have industrial <laughs> factories. All right. So people were like, you know, I want, we had, we get a lot of people who want this whole pre-war kind of. I'm like, you don't really have pre-war. Right. But I was getting a lot of. People agents telling me we're getting a lot of requests for like people who are just coming here and they're like, is there anything pre-war? So my pitch to them was, how about we build like a pre-war from the ground up? Oh, so interesting we, idea. So one building, we basically uh, m like made it like an old fashioned looking brick, uh, had brick interiors, had like shaker cabinetry, which is like in kind of like a more of a traditional kind of like mm -hmm. kitchen look, um, subway tiles on, uh, in the bathrooms, um, and more of like, I guess, a pre-war type of look with regards to finishes. Mm -hmm. We had to give this building a story, um, so research. Yeah, tell me about the process of giving a building a story, because I think that's a lot of the sales process. Yeah, so we be really believe in giving an identity, a brand, and a story to a building. So with this particular one, we were like, okay, there's no real pre-war history over here, uh, per se. What do we? Do? We started looking into the history. We noticed that uh, Long Island City years ago used to be uh, used to have a bookbinding industry. Mm -hmm. um, so we were like, oh, I like that. I like kind of like that direction. Yeah. So then we were like, okay, we're gonna call the building the Bindery, and give it a history of this building used to be mm. a Bindery, mm -hmm. and it was kind of like converted into these apartments, and That's that was cool. kind of like the history. And so we it had has like, like a this library. really cool identity. Correct. So yeah. giving it that identity. So we had like a library and, and, and like in the lounge it's like this. It's a fun theme. Yeah, it was very fun and people loved it. Now you say you own seven out of every ten buildings. That still leaves three out of the other ten to be <laughs> competitors. How do you compete with those people? With the other, with the other three? Yeah. Uh, well, we technically can't own 100% because oh, then it would be a, a monopoly. monopoly. <laughs> right. Right. Um, but, <laughs> um, skip those away. Yeah. Legally, I can't take those. Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to be generous. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we're always we're always uh, competing, and you know, sometimes we don't get every single project that we go after, mm -hmm. and that's totally fine. Um, it it's just it is what it is. I think I like to say that ours are more successful yeah. uh, than the competitors. So when you go to a building and you're competing with others to get 
the job, uh, what information do you provide the building so that they'll hire you over the competition? So we talk about uh, our track record, we talk about the history, um, and then we talk about like our data and information. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, none of our competitors can provide the data that we do because we can give 12 years of data and information and the developers actually need this for their lenders, for their investors, because they can go to anybody and the person can be like, yeah, we could do this and I'll get you X amount of dollars for the apartment. How, are, how do I know you're not just telling me that? Right. Show me the proof that you can get me that. And you're, you've been here longer than anyone else, so yeah. you have the most Correct. data. So we have the, we have the most historical data, yeah. and also because we have a lot of market share over here, not just on what's current, but also on the pipeline. Uh -huh. So like we have probably, like we're working on stuff now that's two, three, four years away. We're working on one project that's actually a 10 year long project. Wow, really? So it's like developing like an entire neighborhood. So we can give also data on like, you're on the pipeline, so if someone's going to be coming to us, hey, I'm building this building, it's probably by the time I do the construction, it'll be coming into market in two years from now, I can tell them, okay, well, in two years from now, this is what your competitors are going to be like, mm. this is how many one bedrooms, this is how many two bedrooms. So it seems like it's, when people move to Long Island City, they're not just moving into a building, they're moving into a neighborhood. And to get that neighborhood going, you have to convince restaurants, shops, and other establishments to move here. Yeah. Uh, how is that part of what you do, trying to build up that whole experience outside of the building? Like, yeah. So yeah. we. Uh, so I'm on the board of several organizations in the neighborhood. One of the uh, organizations is uh, the LIC Partnership, which is mm -hmm. like kind of like the parent org of the LIC Bid. Okay. Uh, and like their their sole mission is to attract businesses to come. Uh, to Long Island City, so I mean, they clean the streets. They do like if you see those beautiful banners out there, yeah. right? So all that stuff is what they do to help promote the neighborhood and also give a lot of like small business advice to businesses who are coming here. So in that sense, I work with them on helping. Mm -hmm. uh, my company also has a commercial division, so we help businesses come in here. So Modern Spaces has opened in Long Island City, Astoria, and Jersey City. Are you thinking of expanding to other areas as well? So right now, uh, we just opened up in Jersey City. We have mm -hmm. 10 agents over there. We also just um, acquired a, a property management company. Um, so we're getting into, I guess, property management also, which is something we weren't doing before. Could you define what property management is specifically? Collecting your rent and Oh, so that's not something that you do no. with yours. OK. Yeah. In the future, maybe I'll be collecting your rent. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Okay. <laughs> but that's basically what property that's basically what property management paying paying all like the bills, the taxes and stuff like that. Gotcha. Um, so we just basically acquired a company based in Jersey City mm -hmm. and we rebranded it uh, as managing spaces. And oh, <laughs> very similar, I like it. And uh, so we're hopefully gonna bring that uh, over here too and okay. and have some properties over here. And then other markets have kinda like thought of aside from within New York City we want to go into uh, Manhattan and mm -hmm. uh, I've actually thought of uh, Miami oh, um, cool. yeah I think our brand would actually work uh, pretty I well think in so. Miami. I do yeah um, so you've done a lot you've covered things that most real estate agents I know you're more than an agent at this point didn't even think of doing and what I want to know is, uh, as an entrepreneur, do you have any advice for aspiring entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think like now is actually a really good time. When I was uh, at home uh, quarantining, uh, I I was excited. I was wasn't excited to be home all the time. Yeah. But I was excited because I knew that uh, in 2008, it just it's a door open for so many opportunities yeah. and now unfortunately it's very sad to see a lot of restaurants or whatever closing but at the same time it's also an opportunity that maybe if you want to be in a restaurant business to open up a restaurant right. or if you have a different uh, different business idea to open up a different uh, business or go into a different uh, trade or career path or whatever um, so one thing about times like this is that there is a lot of opportunities uh, and I'm actually very excited about 2021 uh, 2020, when we were in quarantine, we, des we decided to, we were all working remotely and didn't mm -hmm. lay off anybody or fire anybody or anything like that. And we were very content driven. We don't believe in just like selling you real estate all the time. Yeah. We just feel we're more into like giving you content and 
neighborhood info or whatever. And so we're going to probably like expand that selling more just the brand rather than mm -hmm. just property all the time. That's really smart. Yeah. Because peop it's so, people are exposed to so many ads every day, bombarded with ads. And if you're instead focusing on content, it, it establishes a relationship with your customer Correct. where they trust you. And yeah. they don't think you're just trying to sell them something all the time. No, I'm, a, I'm totally against that. If I go into a, like a boutique and I have a salesperson constantly coming to me, Hey, can I help you? Can I help? It kind of like turns me off. I just want to leave. I want to leave. I usually want to leave. Yeah. So we try to like we have try to have all of our agents not like bombard anybody mm -hmm. and let the person coming into the home just feel at home. Is there anything that you learned along your entrepreneurial journey that you wish you knew when you started out? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I learn every day. Um, I didn't go to college, uh, and I literally just working every day is like been a big, big education. Mm -hmm. I think a couple of mistakes I made in the beginning, which I wish, which I know now, and if I would have known back then, I probably would have had 80% or 90%. But, <laughs> no, but uh, then it would have been a monopoly. Yeah, almost, then it would have so. been a monopoly. But a couple, a couple of things is A, always get a, a really good attorney. Mm. Um, contracts are extremely important. Um, make I sure learned you, that one too. Yes. <laughs> That's a fun one. Yeah. Okay, make sure you do that. Yeah. <laughs> Always, I know this is a go daddy, but always actually, if you have an idea, I have like a couple hundred domains. I had an issue with somebody in the beginning because somebody registered my name, Eric Benheim, and I had to take them to, uh, to court. No and way. Yeah, because of that, because they weren't Eric Benheim, right? <laughs> <laughs> but so always, if you have an idea for a name, like branding is so important, I just buy, I buy names constantly. <laughs> so always do that. And if you have a budget, uh, get a PR agency. Uh -huh. So always, I didn't really get, a, or in the beginning I had a freelancer who wasn't really a PR person. Yeah. Um, and I thought they were a PR person, but they really weren't a PR person. If you're hiring a PR person, make sure they, you, they have real credentials. There's probably a lot of freelancers right now, um, but make sure the PR person has credentials. Okay. And then PR is extremely important because if I had PR, I would have, that's where I probably would have had, uh, my business would have boomed more because I didn't really get any press when I took over like the biggest building in right. the neighborhood. And then that year I took over like three or four buildings and I hardly really got any and press. And that's such a good PR story too. Correct. It's been wonderful having you on the show, Thank Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to everyone who tuned in today. If you want to learn more about Modern Spaces, visit modernspacesnyc.com and follow them on Instagram at Modern Spaces. And that is all for this edition of School of Hustle. You can keep up with us on all of our other episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you stream and download podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please consider leaving a review, share it with your friends, and subscribe to our show. We'll see you next time. Bye.